Power grids are critical infrastructure in modern society, and their stability has long been ensured by established methods. However, the landscape is changing rapidly due to a global shift towards sustainable energy. This transformation, driven by environmental concerns, introduces both increased variability and uncertainty. The rising influence of renewable energy and power electronics presents new challenges in managing grid stability. As renewable energy becomes a larger part of our energy mix, the task of ensuring reliability becomes more complex. Grid stability pillars, according to the main system variable in which the instability event is observed, power system stability is generally classified into rotor angle stability, voltage stability, and frequency stability. Power system stability is defined as the ability of an electrical power system to maintain stable operation after being subjected to large fault events. There are three types of stability associated with the power system, rotor angle stability, voltage stability, and frequency stability. All three must be met all the time to maintain the security of the network. The addition of wind and solar to power grids both internationally has raised concern about how much inertia is needed to maintain frequency stability the ability of a power system to maintain steady frequency following an imbalance between supply and demand. Discussion of inertia must include the interplay of inertia and the many factors that determine the ability of the grid to successfully respond to a contingency, contingency event. Some of these factors are listed in table, which introduces how changing each factor by itself can impact the ability of the system to balance the supply and demand after a contingency event. Each factor is then discussed in detail. Generator inertia is starting point for examining how fast the system must respond to a contingency event. Generator inertia resists changes in system frequency. Under normal conditions, electricity demand is met by the constant injection of energy into the grid from many power plants. Take an example. We illustrate this using an example where 30,000 megawatts MW of demand about the average demand in the state of Florida is met by 31,000 megawatts generators. If one of these generators were to fail, the remaining generators online would only provide 29,000 megawatts. However, the loads on the system would still extract 30,000 megawatts of power from the system, with the extra 1,000 megawatts of power being extracted from the inertia of the remaining online generators. In this example, one can estimate the rate at which frequency declines, which will begin to provide us some indication of the amount of time we have to replace the power from the lost generator and arrest the frequency decline. At the moment the contingency occurs, each of the 29 remaining generators has stored inertia that can be extracted to provide extra power to the system, above and beyond the power provided by continuous injection of steam in the individual power plants. Here, if we assume the generators are all identical, each must provide an extra 34 megawatts of power from from stored energy 1000 megawatts divided by 29 generators. Figure illustrates the source of power from each generator in the post-contingency state. The constant injection of energy from fuel provides 1000 megawatts, and 34 megawatts is drawn from stored energy, meaning each generator is providing 1034 megawatts. Units of energy and inertia, electrical energy is most commonly measured in terms of the amount of power measured in watts delivered over some period of time, typically an hour. The most common units are kilowatt hours, kilowatt hour, megawatt hours, MWH, and gigawatt hours, GWH. For example, one kilowatt hour is equal to the amount of energy delivered by one kilowatt, 1000 watts for one hour or 100 watts for 10 hours. This unit is useful for measuring the energy consumed in a house. Megawatt hours are often used to measure energy produced by individual power plants, while gigawatt hours are used to measure energy used in a large power grid. So, a generator with 1 GWs of inertia can deliver 1 gigawatt of power for 1 second from its stored energy. 1 GWs is equal to 0.27 megawatt hours or 278 kilowatt hours. As each generator uses up its inertia, it slows down. The relationship between rotational speed and energy allows us to calculate how much each generator will slow down and the corresponding decline in frequency. The total system starts at 60 Hz with 115 GWs of stored energy, and the load extracts about 1 GWs after 1 second due to the loss of 1 GW of generation, resulting in a frequency of about 59.7 Hz. If no other action occurs, this will be the frequency at one second. 
Figure shows the frequency as a function of time. This is similar to the plot in figure, but here we are focusing on the first few seconds. In this example, the generator inertia provides about 2 seconds for the system to respond before it falls below 59.5 Hz. Assuming UFLS occurs at 59.5 Hz, this means the system has about 2 seconds to take corrective action. The grid big machines, many power plants are in the range of 100 to 1000 MW. A typical small 100 MW generator has about 0.4 GWs of stored energy or about 110 kWh. This is equal to the kinetic energy of about 150 mid-size sedans traveling at 60 miles per hour, or enough to power an average household for about four days. The kinetic energy stored in a large, 1000 MW generator about 4 GW could power an average household for more than a month. This very simplified case assumes a constant power draw of 30,000 MW and does not consider the reduction in load that results as the frequency declines. It also assumes the inertia of each generator is the same. However, in real systems, inertia varies by generator size and type. For generators of the same type, a 200 MW generator would have roughly twice the inertia of a 100 MW generator. Inertia scales with generator size because generators with larger capacity have more physical mass in the turbine, generator, and other rotating machinery. But two equal sized generators of different types may have different inertia due to the differences in the size and shape of the rotating equipment. This is reported as the inertia constant of a generator or generator type. Inertia scales with generator size because generators with larger capacity have more physical mass mass in the turbine, generator, and other rotating machinery. But two equal sized generators of different types may have different inertia due to the differences in the size and shape of the rotating equipment. This is reported as the inertia constant of a generator or generator type. The combination of inertia constant and total capacity of online generators determines the total inertia provided by the generators. Our simple example is a small system, particularly when compared to the two large U.S. grids. Grid size is a key factor in determining the total grid inertia and therefore how fast the frequency declines. Generator inertia constant, a generator's inertia constant represents how much stored energy it has per unit of rated capacity. This means the inertia constant represents how long the generator could generate at its rated power using only its stored rotational kinetic energy, so the inertia constant is measured in units of seconds. A 1 gigawatt generator with an inertia constant of 4 seconds could deliver 1 gigawatt of power for 4 seconds or has 4 GWs of stored energy. Typical power plants have inertia constants in the range of 2 to 7 seconds, with hydro plants having the lowest inertia, and gas plants having the highest inertia per unit of capacity. Grid size is a critical factor, because inertia increases proportionally with grid size. Larger grids have inherently more inertia however, contingency size does not inherently scale with grid size. Finally, it is important to note that the amount of inertia available from a generator is independent of power output and depends only on whether it is online committed and spinning at grid frequency. Load inertia and damping small but not insignificant, the second element to consider is the response of actual load to changes in frequency. This involves two factors, the inertia of, of loads and the change in actual energy demand as a function of frequency. Unlike an electric light, which shuts off instantly, an electric ceiling fan will continue to turn for some time after it is turned off. This represents inertia similar to that in electric generators. Certain types of motors add inertia to the grid. Another impact results from the actual change in electric demand that happens with changes in frequency. In our previous examples, we assumed the load remains constant after the contingency event. The inertia in load slightly slows the decline in frequency, while the impact of load damping is much greater, particularly as the frequency drops. For example, by the time the frequency reaches 59.6 Hz, the load has dropped by 300 MW, assuming a damping constant of 1 to 3 to 13. This means the imbalance has dropped from 1000 MW to 700 MW. This drop will act to further slow the rate of frequency decline. The combined impact of load inertia and load damping is to add about 0.4 seconds to the time it takes the system to reach 59.5 Hz from 1.8 seconds to 2.2 seconds. UFLS Settings 
keeping the lights on by turning some of them off. The power system's UFLS settings represent the final main element determining how much time is needed to respond. UFLS is initiated by circuit breakers that monitor frequency and automatically disconnect certain parts of the grid rapidly and without warning if the frequency drops below a certain setting. UFLS protocols actually use multiple settings that progressively shed more and more load as frequency drops lower and lower. The basic idea is that a relatively small amount of load is shed at some initial frequency, such as 59.5 Hz. How fast can the system respond? the role of traditional generator frequency response. After a contingency event, PFR acts to increase power from the remaining generators and temporarily replace energy from the failed generator. Providing PFR from a generator requires it to have the necessary equipment I.E., an active governor and be operating at less than full output I.E., providing headroom to increase output. The headroom requirement makes PFR very different from inertia which is independent of its output. Only a generator that can increase output and sustain that output for a period of time can provide PFR. Upon a decline in frequency, generator governors detect this change and act to open valves and take other actions that increase the flow of fuel, steam, and or water to generator turbines. This increases the power produced, but this process takes time, much as it takes a time for a vehicle to accelerate after a driver presses the gas pedal. Examples of PFR response rates are provided in figure next slide, showing the measured PFR from an actual generator curves used for two generator types in simulations. Though the response range is not linear, a typical range of response rates is about 0.3% per second for slower responding units to 2% per second for fast units including certain gas turbines, meaning a 100 MW plant would be able to increase output by between 0.3 MW and 2.0 MW per second assuming it was not already operating at maximum output. Historically, the combination of traditional inertia from both generators and loads plus PFR has been sufficient to address contingency events in most of the United States. But as the grid evolves with the addition of VG and other new technologies, system planners and operators are deploying new ways to maintain stable frequency even with declining amounts of conventional inertia.